ten miles on from Bay, Martigny guards the right angle bend of the Rhone Valley. At Martigny starts a metre gauge route through to the French Alps. Martigny Chatelard first takes us back along the Rhone Valley a couple of miles to Venaille. Third rail electrification starts here and soon we're climbing on the Abdrac at one in five. We're in an important area for electric power generation, first developed in the early 1920s for federal railway electrification and extensively enlarged in recent decades for public supplies. Soon, leaving the Rhone Valley, the Martigny Châtelard will continue its climb on the rack through the 450-yard Charbon Tunnel to emerge at Salvin in the Trian Valley. The south side of this deep, steep-sided valley is in almost permanent shadow, so all settlement is on the north side. At Le Tretien, we shall shortly meet an old Zurich tram on a works train. It's cleared the single line for us to pass. Overnight maintenance work is hardly practical in this sort of country. Our track is said to be 1,400 feet above the Triant stream along here. No wonder speed is low. Fano, a surprisingly large village. By road from Martigny, one would travel by a totally separate route which joins us at the French border. Martigny town to Le Châtelard Frontière opened in 1906. It was electrified at 750 volts DC from the start. The diversion from Martigny CFF station opened in 1931. Here at Le Châtelard Gitros is CFF's power station of the 1920s. Next station is Le Châtelard Frontière, last on Swiss soil. On SNCF track we pass the frontier post. On a low speed line, the French equivalent of a distance signal is the sign Gare, here painted on the stone wall. This is Valorcine. We shall change here into the SNCF train across the platform. In recent years, MC and SNCF jointly bought new trains which run right through, eliminating changing. Emerging from the mile-long tunnel under the Col de Monte, we catch our first glimpse of Mont Blanc. Le Châtelet de Chamonix was opened in 1908 by the Paris Lyon Méditerranée Company and nationalized in 1938. This train will go on from Chamonix to Saint-Gervais, the start of standard gauge. One can continue to Geneva's French station, Eau Vive, making a circular trip based on Saint-Montreux, but check train times, French secondary services are sparse. An SNCF works train, powered by one of the motorised wagons built for this steep line's freight service. This is Chamonix, Wheeler Light. But this wonderful trip is possible on a day out from several Swiss holiday places. On the second cable car of the ascent, Alan could only find space in the middle, hence the over-the-head shots. This is the terrace on the Aiguille du Midi, 12,600 feet above sea level more than 1,200 feet higher than Jungfrau Joch. We've climbed almost 9,200 feet above Chamonix. Today, this spot is about one and a half miles vertically above the Mont Blanc road tunnel. To 
despite the public transport option, some people still prefer to come up the hard way. The valley west from Chamonix, towards Saint-Gervais. In the lower right corner, Chamonix Station. But we've not finished our travels up here on Mont Blanc. These four-seater telecabines will take us three miles onwards to Pointe Heilbrunner. These cabins are permanently attached to the cable in groups of three. As each group passes through the terminal stations, the haulage cable, and hence all the cabins, right across the mountain, slows down to allow passengers to board and alight. This produces the odd effect of passing groups of cabins alternately at speed and then very slowly. Some months prior to Alan's visit, this line suffered a collision with a low-flying military aircraft. The haulage cable was severed and some cabins fell into the snow below. Many passengers were unavoidably marooned in mid-air until rescued. The effects of this accident will be why some groups are of only two cabins. This ridge provides support for the cables and allows the line a slight change of direction. Below us now is the Glacier du Géant. The Agui du Géant. Imagine, if you will, the problems of providing support pylons for the cables through goodness knows what depth of permanent but very slowly moving snow. The only practical solution has been transverse cables slung from rocky heights on either side. The practical difficulties of installing these and the tensions on the cables must be truly enormous. So we arrive at Pointe Heilbrunner, just into Italy. There's a cable car down from here to Courmayeur. 